Each and every week, we gather for a time of prayer. We come together as part of the body of Christ and we share our joys, we share our concerns. Knowing that we walk with one another, we support each other along the way. So I invite you now to look at the prayer list, which is on the back of your bulletin. It was also emailed out earlier this week. I invite you to take a few moments and review the list of names. For these names represent our family and our friends, people in our community and our nation and our world who are in need of God's comfort and peace. We continue to hold our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan in our prayers. We lift up the families of the servicemen and women who lost their lives this past week. We lift up our leaders and ask for God's wisdom to lead them and guide them in all that they do. We lift up our brothers and sisters on the Gulf Coast as they are preparing for a hurricane. We lift up our brothers and sisters in Haiti as they continue to recover from the earthquake. We are reminded at this time that when one part of the body hurts, we all hurt. And there is so much in this world that is causing pain. And so we take a few moments to go to God in prayer, knowing that God is here with us, surrounding us with peace and love. Let us pray. God, in this place, in this sanctuary, we come to you. And we continue to live in this time of here, but not yet. We know that your kingdom is here with us, yet we know it is not fully realized here on earth. We live in this time of knowing, yet so much is not known. It seems like things are changing day by day, minute by minute. And so we come to you for wisdom. We come to you for guidance. We come to you for your grace and your love. We ask that you hold us gently in this place. In your arms of comfort, your arms of love. Hold us gently in this place until we are certain in the ways of loving our neighbors as ourselves. Until we are certain that all are a part of the body of Christ. Hold us in this place. Remind us of our call to bring about your kingdom here on earth for all of your people. God, we come together. And we know that we are called to love each other, to love as you have loved us, to see past the labels which this world has placed upon us, to see you in each and every one we meet and encounter. As your people, let us not toss ourselves and neighbors into thoughtless harm, but look for the common good. Let us recall that all life is sacred in your eyes, that all are your beloved, whose care we are blessed to bear. We are connected to one another, each a brother and sister in faith and in love. As we gather for prayer this morning, with so much hurt and brokenness in the world, we seek your blessing upon those who are bringing healing and wholeness to your people to the hospital workers, to emergency services, ambulance drivers, doctors, nurses. May your care flow from their hands. We know that there are those who have answered the call to care for us in our times of physical healing, our mental healing, our spiritual healing, and that no matter our opinion, our ideology, or hardship, O oh God, we are called to care for our neighbors, to see each other as beloved sisters and brothers in faith. God, as we gather this morning in prayer, 
Help us to hear that caring for one another is a command, your command on our lives. Open our ears to hear the tragedy in this time and not only our own anxiety and grief that may come on as blustering words and tired rhetoric, but may we hear your words calling us together as one. Let us think on how we will make this world a better place. Let us think on how and what kindness, and however small we might offer someone. Let us remember that our life is not our own, but it belongs to you, a gift given to be used to build up your kingdom here on earth. This morning, let us dream how we might enter our communities to be beacons of hope for those living in disorder, to come along beside them so that they may find peace so that they may come along beside us and know your healing and wholeness. God, as we gather for prayer this morning, help us always to remember our promise to you, our call as your servants, that we will care for our neighbors as we care for ourselves. It is in your name we pray. Amen. At this time, it is my honor to welcome the choir of Midway Christian Church. Again, with the changing times and rising numbers of COVID, our choir has recorded their anthem. And so I invite you to listen to their anthem, which is Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Grown.
Our scripture this morning comes from the letter to Philemon. It's Philemon 1. I invite you to follow along as we read our scripture. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our friend, our dear friend and co-worker, to Apphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God, because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do in Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he may be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about you owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let this let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. One more thing, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greeting, and so do also Mark, our aristocrats, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I would be remiss if and I did not name that this short book, which is only one chapter, that this short book has done a lot of damage over the years. During the years surrounding the Civil War, this letter was used to support slavery. Many who owned slaves, many who supported slavery, argued that Paul condoned slavery because he sent Onesimus, a supposed runaway slave, Paul sent Onesimus back to Philemon. This argument was widely accepted by society at that time. Unfortunately, it wasn't just the years surrounding the Civil War that this argument was accepted. This small book has been used to write laws, to enact practices, to support systems that allowed others to see others as less than. This unethical practice happened because like so many other books in our Bible and letters in our Bible, you know, letters found in there, I'm not going to say one like 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 36, not being too specific or anything. But text and letters and books from our Bibles have been used to bring and support ideas that maybe not necessarily fit the values of the kingdom of God. And this happens because somewhere along the way in church tradition, 
someone reads the text and they interpret it through their social standards at that time. Thankfully, biblical scholarship has advanced since then over the years, and many of these incorrect interpretations have been fixed over the years. Yet the damage still remains. This damage is still creating brokenness in our midst. It's still being used as permission from one group to see another group as less than. The damage from misinterpreting scriptures by us as people of faith, dare I say it, is one of the largest roadblocks for the coming about of God's kingdom here on earth. All of this is background as we look at this letter to Philemon. This is why it's important for us to have conversations about these texts here in worship and as we study as people of faith. It's our responsibility as people of faith to know what is written in our text, to read it daily, to know what is in that text. It's our responsibility as the people of God to know how our scriptures are being used or misused in the name of faith. As people of God, it is our responsibility to take an impartial look at this text, to look at them within their context. It is our responsibility to discern what is actually going on in this text and not just assume we think we know what is happening. So that's what we're going to do with this letter of Philemon. We're going to take a look at it within its context and discern what Paul is saying in this beautifully crafted letter. Because this letter is as relevant to us today as people of faith as it was it's written 2,000 years ago to that community Paul first shared it. Like all letters found in our Bible, when we look at this letter to Philemon, we have to realize that we only have one side of the conversation. And it's up to us to fill in those gaps. Now, this usually means as we're filling in those gaps, there's lots of theories that go around of what's happening in here. And with this letter to Philemon, no different. Lots of theories about what has actually happened, especially around this question of Onesimus was actually a runaway slave or not. Because nowhere in the text does it specifically say he ran away? That language is never used. One theory is that Philemon sends Onesimus to Paul, who has been under house arrest, and Paul can have visitors. And so Paul is using and needing Onesimus there to help him kind of care for himself, to do tasks. And it develops into where Anisibus creates this relationship with Paul and becomes a Christian and does work on behalf of the gospel. Paul realizes that Onesimus has overstayed that length of time that Philemon had given him to be able to be there. So Paul sends him back with this letter and realizes that he needs to correct the mistake and says, if there's any wrongdoing, if any money is owed, charge it to my account and I will take care of it. Again, this is a theory. All we really know is that Paul sends Onesimus back with this letter. All we know is that Onesimus has this relationship with Paul and is transformed and he becomes a Christian. And because of that relationship, we get this letter, which is a beautifully crafted letter that's full of rhetoric that is to change the narrative of how we see relationships in our Christian community. When we read this letter, we realize that Paul is walking a very fine line in church leadership, one that ministers know really well. Philemon is a leader in the church. He's, his, the house church is meeting in his house, so he is wealthy, and he is supporting fi Paul financially. Paul realizes that he cannot ostracize Philemon at all. Yet, Paul is confident when he says, I'd not rather not command you to do something, but make it your duty that you realize this, that things have changed in this relationship. I want you to do the right thing. Paul states that Onesimus is now a Christian. 
and he's sending them back and everything in that relationship has changed. That this community of faith is no longer to see him as a slave. He is to see him as a brother. That they are to operate from now on by the values of the kingdom of God. In this letter, Paul pushes the community of faith to see Onesimus beyond the labels, to see his full humanity. And Paul doesn't do it perfect. Again, that we're looking at this context of this letter. It was not written for us in 2021. But Paul does take big steps in enacting justice and changing the narrative so that we can see that there is something different for how we are called to be as people of faith. You see, this letter doesn't claim deep theological discourse, and it doesn't have these words of comfort and hope that we often turn to as people of faith. Yet what it does contain speaks to the very heart of our faith. It reminds us that as servants of Christ, we are to be in this world, but not of this world. That we operate by a different set of values, values of grace and love and acceptance, values that shape how we interact, how we see each other. This letter reminds us that as communities of faith, there is not one who is more than another. We are reminded slave or free, young or old, woman or man, no more. We are all equal in the body of Christ. We are all welcome at the table. We are all beloved children of God, regardless of the labels that this world puts upon us. Or let me say it this way. As a minister, everyone wants to talk religion to you, no matter where you are. And it's a blessing and a curse of this profession. I'm sure doctors feel the same way wherever they go to dinners. As soon as you find your profession, you get the questions and you're supposed to have all the answers. And this week it was the same way. I was a gathering on Tuesday night and I was having a conversation with someone and suddenly this person realized that I was the minister of this particular church and the dynamics of the conversation completely changed. They went from easy and free to very standoffish. She immediately shared with me that she had grown up in a religious household, that she was not religious anymore, and she didn't believe in that stuff anymore. When I heard that, my heart hurt. I really wanted to ask those probing questions like, well, what changed? What happened? What, what brought all this change about? But I realized I probably knew the answer. My guess is, if I had to take one, that the teachings that were meant for love and grace and acceptance were used to create division and separation. But that wasn't the only incident this week. Just yesterday, I was at another gathering, and again, someone found out I was a minister. And immediately, this person shared to me that her son was not baptized. Because he was not baptized, the reason was given... Um, she was not allowed to have family of a different religious and tradition be a part of the service. So just said no baptism at all. And she said, my heart is hurt. My son is not baptized and he does not have godparents. No one is there to guide them on the faith because the church would not allow people from a different tradition to come be a part of that service. And I again wanted to ask the questions of what was the reasoning the priest gave you? Or what was the reasoning that religious institution gave you? But again, I probably knew the answer again. My guess is that teachings that were meant for love and grace and acceptance were used or abused to bring about separation and division. Again, I'm standing up here this week and I'm going to say again, I don't have all the answers. But what I do know is if we read our sacred text in any way that leads us to any conclusion that is not loving one another with all our heart and mind and soul that like God has taught us to do, then we're reading the text wrong. I keep coming back to Paul's words to Philemon, and I invite you to hear them again. I'm sending him who is my own heart back to you. These words describe a relationship. They're saturated in love and hope. They're saturated in connection and promise. 
These strong words remind us of our call to see each other, not as how the world views us, but to see each other, encounter each other as how God sees us, created in the image of God and loved more than we will ever know. These strong words remind us that justice begins when we practice what we preach, when we believe and act out in everything we do, that all are welcome, that all are part of the body of Christ, that all are seen and welcome as beloved children of God, regardless of the labels that this world puts upon us. These words that Paul pens to Philemon, they remind us that we are called to practice grace and acceptance in all we do and everything we say. These Strong's words remind us as people of faith, this world, the people we encounter, all of God's people will know we are Christians by our love. May it be so. Amen.